you all for coming tonight. Uh, I'm Sherry Gardner from Friends of the Napa River, one of the uh, hosts of these events, uh, along with the Napa Resource Conservation District, the Watershed Information Center and Conservancy, the Carolyn Park Nature Museum, and the Napa Green Program. And thank you very much to our host, the Napa Public Library. We really appreciate the space to have these monthly lectures. Uh, these lectures occur every second Wednesday of the month at 7 o'clock, same time, same place, so be sure to join us. Um, next up is going to be Wildlife and Restoration in the Napa River, focusing on the flood control project up and down the Napa River and all kinds of wildlife habitat and uh, the return of wildlife to the Napa River system. Um, in October, we'll have a program on lichen. Who doesn't like lichen? Uh, dragonflies is the subject for November, and lampreys is December, so that'll be exciting too, the, the funny, uh, interesting species. Um, a couple quick announcements. Um, the Youth Ecology Corps, for those of you who have or know of young adults who are looking for work, uh, Voices Napa is recruiting natural resource field technicians and a crew leader, and um, it's a seven week training program for young adults ages 18 to 24 in the natural resources management field. Uh, participants have an opportunity to work throughout Napa County on open space and flood control projects and it starts August 22nd. We've got a flyer over on the table if you'd like more information on that. Um, or you can contact voices directly. Um, also upcoming is September 17th from nine to noon is the Coastal Cleanup Day, also known as Creek to Bay Cleanup Day. There are lots of sites throughout Napa County, uh, opportunity to go out and, and clean up our waterways and keep trash from ending up in the river and in the ocean. Um, there's a flyer for that also over on the table and naparcd.org has more information. You can sign up to volunteer uh, through them. It's actually an international volunteer event, so people will be cleaning up all over the place, all over the world. So for tonight, we have um, an expert in our midst. Uh, Quentin Martins, PhD, is a wildlife ecologist at the Bouvray Preserve and lead researcher for the Audubon Canyon Ranch Mountain Lion Project. Dr. Martins is the former founder and CEO of the Cape Leopard Trust, a successful predator conservation non-governmental organization based in South Africa. He has over 20 years field experience, having worked in wilderness areas throughout much of Africa, Saudi Arabia, and the US. From specialist safari guiding, leading a scorpion collecting expedition to the Smithsonian Institute in the deserts of Namibia, to mist netting birds in Central African rainforests, Quinton turned to studying predators in 2003. He completed his PhD, The Ecology of Leopards in the Cedarburg Mountains, South Africa, through University of Bristol in the UK in 2010, and is considered the world's leading expert on Cape Mountain leopards and a skilled predator trapper. Quinton's a research associate and fellow at Bristol and Stellenbosch Universities, and he's here to talk about charismatic, iconic cats with us, including our own local charismatic cats. So enjoy, and thank you again for coming. Thank you, I'm, I hope it's okay if I don't uh, use the microphone. I'll project my voice. Can you hear me at the back? Good? Fantastic. <laughs> well, I don't know where Sherry got that information. It's the Napa Library. I'm sure their reference, um, their reference uh, references are credible, but it um, seems like I've been busy for the last 20 years. So, um, it's wonderful to be here. Thanks very much for, for coming to, to the talk tonight. Um, I've, in fact, it's amazing that I'm still standing right now because I haven't actually had like any sleep. We've been trapping mountain lions in Sonoma County and this morning we had, or last night, we had a mountain lion that um, had killed a large buck, a deer, male deer, in somebody's garden on Dry Creek Road. <laughs> It fed on the thing on the front lawn, <laughs> like out in the open, no problems, just hanging out there, feeding, really nice sort of, you can imagine a Pinot Noir on the side, ah, <laughs> like oh, lovely, yes, the Napa climate is wonderful for this. 
anyway, we were called in, and we, which was a great opportunity to try and capture this animal to put a GPS collar on it. And frantically went out there with our traps, headed into the valley. You're crossing the border from Sonoma into Napa. It's quite intimidating, to say the least. <laughs> anyway, got in there and, and um, got the trap set, and then you have to sit because right, you, you put these trap monitors on the traps, the cages, and and typically one would sort of check the trap every 15 minutes, but of course we were like checking them every sort of minute. <laughs> Has the trap been doing it? Yeah, anyway, right the way through the night, and eventually at 3:30 we closed the traps this morning and. The mountain lion had gone off to another delicatessen down the road. <laughs> so we didn't get it. Anyway, so tonight I am going to talk to you about mountain lions and predators and their role in the ecosystem. Um, and I thought I'd just sort of give you a preview of what I'm going to be doing. Um, I thought it would be useful to start off with a bit more of my background um, to kind of contextualize the work and why I'm doing it um, in, in this area. Uh, then go more into how sort of large predators function in the system and how important they are. Um, and then get into the, like the real meaty stuff, you know, excuse the pun, but to get, to get into you know, the, the actual mountain lion project that we're doing. And then, um, you know, get on to telling you guys more about how you public can help and you know, sort of uh, engaging with our organization and, and uh, conservation as a whole. So to begin with, um, my career really started as um, a law student going to university after leaving school thinking I was going to become a lawyer and the glamorous life and that and realized that an office job was certainly not for me. So I um, packed up my things in my third year and just sort of headed out into the bush, into the wilderness of Africa and started working as a safari guide. And I worked in some of the most amazing wilderness areas in the world, really. It was just fantastic. You know, it, made, it was such a privilege to be able to go out and work in these incredible places and for like 10 years, I was living the dream, you know, taking tourists out and showing them animal behavior in these incredible places and being able to watch wild, free-roaming animals do what they do, unhindered. And, you know, towards the end of that time, I was like, you know, sort of felt I kind of needed to do something, getting to see what was going on in these wilderness areas and how, from political to various conservation issues, how these wilderness areas really needed our protection, I saw that I needed to go back and study further um, in this field to be able to actually contribute towards the conservation of these wilderness areas. So, in 2000 and, what, 2000 I think it was, as a, a mature student, I went back to University um, to study a degree in zoology, and from there I went on um, to set up my own organization um, on uh, leopards, Cape Mountain leopards, in fact. It's a non profit that I set up, and soon after, my wife joined me, and soon after that, we had a youngster that. Um, joined us and the whole family sort of became part of this, this organization and, and my, my little girl who's four now um, got to experience and, and um, meet interesting creatures from a very young age. This is a caracal that, that I just caught and was putting a um, telemetry, a radio tracking device on it. Um, and my wife had set up the environmental education program for, for the Cape Leopard Trust. Now, the area was a really wild mountain area in South Africa, and I got to see what was really interesting for me was, you know, starting out having this idea of, well, I was going to study these really elusive ghost-like creatures, 
in the mountains that were very rarely seen. To go and study them, it was just, it was like, okay, it was a great challenge, you know, and I got to do this work, and, but soon realized that the, the actual project, the actual animal, should I say, leopards themselves, are so iconic in their nature that they really attract attention. And over the years, as the project developed, I realized that I was able to do a lot more for broader conservation by using the leopard as this flagship or umbrella species to attract attention to broader environmental issues. So, for example, I was able to fund and initiate work on rock hyrax, these small little marmot-like animals, yeah. dussies, and small ungulates, virus eagle, the black eagles, beautiful eagles, and all of that under the umbrella of the leopard. So, the leopard I got to see was really useful from that point of view, and that's, these charismatic cats are really good, good for that. I then thought, well, you know, I'm kind of like this big fish in a small bowl kind of thing, you know, doing this, doing this work where I am. And I thought it would be great to be able to see how this concept or this way of working with these cats could be spread out in other areas where it hadn't been. I went to go work in Saudi Arabia on the Arabian Leopard Project. Unfortunately, there aren't any resident leopards in Saudi Arabia anymore. They've pretty much been extirpated. Um, I worked in Malawi on leopards there, and again, just getting to use my experience and going to different, different places. I then received a postcard from a friend. And I kept, I still have this postcard, and I thought, geez, I don't know if you can read it, but that here, it's like, Mountain Lion Artificial Insemination Team, <laughs> Colorado. I was perplexed. I was totally smitten by this sort of, this, this image of these guys doing this very valuable work. Very... Clearly very dangerous work. And um, got the postcard and then you know, I had my, my, my eyes set on coming to America to, to experience mountain lion research in, in America. And, and of course as a South African, America, the way one, what, what we sort of picture America being, I mean apart from Trump right now, is, is Hollywood. <laughs> So I headed off to, to Hollywood first, it was my first stop. And I don't know if you know this, but this is P-22. It's a very famous, well-known mountain lion who hangs out in Griffith Park, in, in, um, just below the Hollywood sign in that very small area around the observatory. Anyway, I got, I got to spend some time with researchers of the National Park Service working there. And I then went over to Nevada, I worked with the mountain lion researcher there for a bit. The idea was to really look at an, an, an analogous species in similar environments to what we had with our leopards, our mountain leopards. So around Cape Town, one of our study sites, we had, it was pretty much like this, where we had vineyards and really nice wines, and we had leopards, and you can drink wine and have leopards around you, and like here we could do the same. Also in a fire-driven system like the chaparral, the Feinbos in South Africa has got this fire driven system, very similar. And then Nevada was more like my Cedarburg study site where I did my initial research. And that was a really wild area um, and rugged mountainous area. So I got to, I got to experience this and, um, and that's really what, what got me into to mountain lions. Now to go more into the role of top predators in the ecosystem. And I think that this is really important, critical in fact, in, in understanding um, why these animals should be here um, and, and how important they are in the system. So first of all, when we look at our top terrestrial predators, tigers and jaguars and bears and wolves and all sorts of things like that, almost 
All of these animals are far ranging. They have massive territories, sometimes thousands of square miles. It's just insane how far they can roam. They can be generalists, but often they have real habitat preferences. Some animals like certain things, key things that they need in their environment because of their hunting techniques or whatever it might be, how they need to secure prey in an environment. Amazingly enough, if we consider mountain lions in North America, there probably isn't a single mountain lion in America that has not the chance of bumping into a human being. So there's always going to be this potential conflict, if you like, or overlap with humans somewhere along the line. We've found out now really hundreds, probably thousands of studies now, have shown how important these predators, these apex predators are in the ecosystem and how an ecosystem's functioning, how for an ecosystem to be intact and functioning, you need these apex predators. I'm going to show you a video just after this about trophic cascades and wolves in Yellowstone and it's a phenomenon which will be well explained there. But the, the other thing that top predators, which I want to talk about, is it's not only their ecological role, but their conservation role um, that they have in, in, in the system. So the traffic escape, I've got a very simple sort of diagrammatic um, sketch here to show you, you know, what happens if you remove a wolf from your system you know, you kind of get this idea. The following video is really, I think it's an amazing video to show you um, what traffic escapes are and how important large predators are in the, in the ecosystem. So, it's about four minutes long. Just relax and enjoy it. scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, but the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, They'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers uh, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes. And as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. 
Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transform not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. What's been interesting in, in the Yellowstone area, in the, in the, uh, in the Teton mountain ranges, uh, for instance, just south of Yellowstone, is that the mountain lion numbers have been quite significantly affected by uh, wolves coming into to these areas. So the wolves are killing, killing the mountain lion kittens, youngsters, so they've got higher mortality rates. So the mountain lion numbers are decreasing. But there's, there's a trade-off, or there's, you know, you know it's, it's kind of most likely going to get to some kind of balance where um, mountain lion numbers would have been when wolves were there before, because for quite a while wolves weren't in that area. And um, what's also happening is, is that the deer are forced into these wooded areas, which are great for the mountain lions, so the mountain lions are getting more access to food, but then they're getting you know, they have the threat of the wolves killing their youngsters. So it's, it's, um, it's quite interesting, the work that's been done. There's been a really great study that's been done there for some time now. So that was a, a really good explanation of the ecological role of large predators. I'd like to see that, you know, one also looks, the, the conservation role of these predators could also be looked at in a way that, just look at how brands like Jaguar, for instance, have used the iconic nature, charismatic, majestic nature of these large apex predators to show off their brands. <laughs> Apple and Snow Leopard. Not that Snow Leopard conservation benefits benefit from, from Apple from this, but anyway, it's uh, certainly Certainly a beautiful photograph, and uh, again showing the iconic nature of, of these cats. I love this mountain yeah, lion yeah. on puma shoes. So, how better to attract attention to to something through using like an iconic animal, for instance? You know, if I had to set up instead of the Cape Leopard Trust, I had to set up the Cape Rock Hyrax Trust. You know, you'd, you'd be like, you'd have, you'd have mil millions of people not coming to your talks. <laughs> you know, be, people wouldn't take any notice. But you know, you could do work with leopards, and people are attracted. You know, you get their attention, and and this is where you know we can focus on these top trophic levels, these charismatic apex predators. 
what you have to do to, in order to affect their conservation means that you have to ensure their habitat is intact. Corridors have to be in place. You have to have sufficient prey. Fragmentation shouldn't be, um, you know, shouldn't uh, stop genetic or gene flow between the populations. So, pretty much, if you can conserve one of these guys, then you're doing a good job of conserving your habitat. And that's, I think, like an important way to look at it. And Audubon Canyon Ranch, or ACR as we like to be known because we don't want to be confused with it, um, or we shouldn't be confused with the Audubon Society, um, uses or has used these top wetland predators, egrets and herons, as a way of protecting ecosystems. The Bolinas Lagoon is a really great example in the, in the 50s and 60s. Um, when the heron and egret uh, populations were conserved in, in that area, resulted in the conservation of that entire or a large part of, of the Sonoma and Marin West, West Coast area. And this mountain lion project really fits in very well with ACR's mission and vision in terms of trying to connect people to nature and using research as a way of of doing good outreach and getting um, people connected to the areas they live in. To get to the meaty bit now about the actual mountain lion project that, that we're doing. Pretty much from a scientific point of view, we're going to be looking at corridors, home ranges, you know, how far do they range these animals, how big are their territories. Um, looking at movement and activity, diet, genetics. So it's a, it's a very broad ecological study looking at behavior and ecology, looking at issues in terms of whether there's gene flow issues due to fragmentation in the habitat. Um, and you know, looking at, at survival and mortality rates, what's causing the mortality of, of lions in these areas? Is it, is it um, through vehicle accidents? Is it through secondary poisoning? from rodenticides, things like that. Um, and those are pretty general. It's not like rocket science. We're not, it's not, um, the project is well grounded, trying to provide the scientific information that would help us conserve this population. However, I think the one thing that stands out from other studies, and there have been a multitude of studies in America on mountain lions. You need papers, scientific papers, tons of them published on these animals. But there's very little outreach. So comparatively, no outreach compared to the amount of research that's been done. And that's something very different to elsewhere in the world where these large predators are studied. There's generally less research and more outreach. You guys have got an awesome animal here. Mountain lions are just classic. It's, you know, they play such an important role in the system, plus they're cool. Um, people go to Africa to go on safari to see lions and leopards and things like that. You know, you've got like the most cool animals right here in your backyard. So, I would like to see, you know, from my side, I'm certainly really pushing with the outreach side of things to, to get it out there. That people, this landscape of fear about how dangerous mountain lions are and how when you're walking on the trails you've got to look around you know, there's a mountain lion about a pounce any moment <laughs> you know when you statistically the chances of being attacked by a mountain lion you know you've probably got like a thousand times more risk of being struck by lightning um, I think in, in a hundred years something like a handful of people have died from mountain lion attacks and half of those were from rabies more people get killed by dogs in a year than <laughs> in America than have ever been killed by mountain lions over you know, 100 years or something like that. So that's sort of outreach and education about, about these animals. And then again going on to the broader conservation side of, of what they represent and how we can conserve the area more. So how are we doing this? First of all the study area, we're pretty much focusing east of the Highway 101 um, and then going from, as you can see, from San Pablo up to the Mendocino um, County border in the north, and then mostly in Sonoma, but also going into Napa in some parts um, of the study area. 
The, the idea is to focus on the Mayakamo mountain range um, to monitor the population in that area. Now, one of the best tools for scientists over the last 10 or 15 years um, has been the use of trail cameras or these, um, these camera traps as they're also known who like these 24-hour observers sitting out there, rain or shine, sitting there waiting for any movement of an animal to come past and they take a photograph and we're able to identify the animals, we can determine presence, absence of these animals, we can look at activity. With some animals we can count them and with some populations we can get some kind of idea of, of their relative abundance. Um, so the camera traps are really useful from that point of view. And in my study in South Africa, for instance, I used these cameras a lot and got some really cool photos. <laughs> when I started, I, I set the project up on my own. I didn't have any help, so I employed the use of baboons. <laughs> they helped me. And we got on really well initially. They did good work. Um, uh, until the trade union movement oh. sort of started and the dudes were asking for more wages and we had issues and then they started um, striking and twisting cameras around and doing all sorts of things. Anyway, we got rid of the baboons, but um, what we did learn from the baboons was that they had a very artistic eye. You see, scientists can be a little, well, you know, stale if you like um, and you know, we would set the camera and it would be like at 90 degrees to the path and 90 degrees to the ground and had to be 40 centimeters and, and know, inches you know, anyway you know about that high and um, and you'd have this whole thing of like you know everything was perfect and the baboons came along and they started twisting these things around and and then so we got these awesome photographs it was like whoa cool we would never have got this photograph if it wasn't for the baboon that had moved the camera like, right off to the side. So I was like, okay, well, we're going to relook at this whole thing. So I started adapting our, our trapping thing. That's an art valve, okay? And, it's a, um, and they feed on termites. They're related to hyenas. Okay, very cool animal. Every time the camera flashes, the guard hairs go up. <laughs> totally like. Uh, it's crazy. Artifacts, okay. there's nails, a genet, a spotted genet, very cool, very cool animals. Oh, oh, no, this is, that's not me, by the way. Um, we got this camera out there, and like, where's the black? In midsummer, this guy's hiking around just with his backpack and boots on. I mean, it's like, it's just like, what? What is this? He didn't know the camera was there, obviously. <laughs> I say obviously, I hope, obviously. <laughs> anyway, and then like cool, cool leopard shots. <laughs> and this was, this was, you know, this was, this photograph was really, I must thank the baboons for this photograph because we went and we're like, ah, oh, what, what would the baboons do? You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> put, the, put the camera in the river. Like actually in this little stream, you know, like put the camera, obviously like not in winter when like the rains would come, but we like had the camera there during summer and had like in the river and then waited because I knew this leopard would come across um, at this particular place and then we got this photograph of this beautiful male jumping over. Wow. And, uh, and then of course with the, with the camera traps, with the leopards, it was quite easy to identify individuals because like our fingerprints, they each had unique spot patterns. Whereas mountain lions, of course, don't. Now, mountain lions, when you see it, man, they like difficult. You got to first of all, you got to try to see if it's a male or a female. They they're not always that easy to identify from the camera trap photographs, and then to identify individuals. Now, you could if you get a really good photo where you can see tatters on like tears on the ears or scratches on the nose and things like that. But often you can't identify individuals that easily. And we used to be able to count the mountain lions literally by you know creating these identic kits of these animals and then you know basically every time you get an animal walking past we'd be able to say okay this is joe or this is you know whoever and um and and with mountain lions it's different it's not that easy now in our area we've got camera traps running through sonoma county for instance and we've you know we've got some really cool photographs of animals here and um using Oh, there, look at those cool guys. I mean, you guys have got some cool animals, man. Yeah, <laughs> 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 
animals. We just got a photograph of a bear two days ago up in Glen Ellen and, and it was at one of our baits and the baits we'd been like totally wiped out by the vultures and there was nothing left and the bear was like oh just lying there like going oh I wish there was still food you know they, like, just, <laughs> just imagine going like oh man the bear necessities. And then mountain lions of course and these photographs were taken at Bouverie and Hood Mountain this one is up at Bouvery Preserve, up on 12. Now, the cameras, the trail cameras are generally like low quality images and that sort of thing. I mean, they're great for documenting animals, but to get a high resolution photograph, we can use like an SLR, DSLR camera or something like that and set up. And this is um, Sebastian, Sebastian Kellenek, who's a professional wildlife photographer, myself setting up one of these um, really cool camera setups so that we can get high quality images. And those images can be used for educational purposes to really promote projects and, and, and that. This is up at our ACR property at Medini Maikamas in the, in the northern part of Sonoma. Three and a half thousand acre property, beautiful up there. And we set these cameras up in, in South Africa on my project as well. And this was with Steve Winter at National Geographic. And we got these really cool leopard photographs. This is a male. And you know, it's like a studio. You set these cameras up, and I mean, it's in, we basically, we would like, when you're trapping, using foot snares and things like that, you know, which are really great trapping techniques, by the way. Don't get like, oh, oh. foot snares are really cool. Though. You just gotta know how to do it. And you gotta like, you, you can know exactly where the animal's gonna put its feet. And we do this with these cameras because it's got a laser beam that goes across. And you wanna basically be able to get the center of the focus of the image at a particular place, so we wanted this leopard to come and put its foot on that rock, and it was like, okay, ching, 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 and then like every time that it would come up and put its foot on that rock, and then you would have a chance of getting like a really cool photograph. And this one was um, of a cub that was in National Geographic in December last year that was published. So we were trying to do this here um, with the mountain lions, and that was me <laughs> testing, you know, testing, <laughs> crawling around. I gotta be the mountain lion. And note the time, and this is just this to tell you that mountain lions aren't always nocturnal. It is 13.52, and, and at 15.28, like an hour and a half later, oh there comes a mountain lion just walking. <laughs> it's like, oh, who was this crawling around here? So that was pretty cool. Anyway, we, got, we managed to find a kill that was made by a mountain lion. And... Um, we set up this camera setup. This is my colleague Jennifer Potts, who's helping me there, and um, we got some. <laughs> we got we got a mountain lion photograph. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Just look at that bum. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a raindrop just over there. It was when we had these lovely rains, you know. So we had that raindrop over there. So we got some cool photos of them. But we'll keep trying and getting um, getting the, the photos and. Um, that's a lovely photograph of a female, you know, lovely, lovely cat. Anyway, so the, the camera traps are very cool. You got to do all these things with them, they're really great and they're good to have out there. We use them all the time. But to get really good information on the movement of these cats, the one thing that we need to do is to be able to track them using GPS collars. And it's just fantastic technology available to us now. These collars that send the data via satellite back to our computer so we can hang out with our feet up, watch the football, drinking beer, while the data comes streaming in. <laughs> Actually, no, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of hard work. But we've got, to, we've got to trap the animals first, and that's the big thing. So the way we do it is, right, there, we're quite limited in the different ways that we can do it in California, but the way we, we um, go out to, to try and trap mountain lions in order to be able to put these, to, to, to color them with these GPS colors, is by putting roadkill deer bait out, right? Um, so Caltrans and these guys help us out, they bring these roadkill deer to us, and then we put the bait out, and we then often use a caller, no, I mean often caller, 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 a, like a digital speaker system to call the lions in, like from the area. They're pretty loud, and we use different calls, so we can create like 
hits of the 80s and different kind of <laughs> tunes that we come up with, like um, Deer Distress Calls and, and um, Jack Rabbit Distress Calls. And sometimes we use mountain lion calls. Um, <coughs> mating call of a mountain lion. <coughs> if you hear this, it's pretty cool. So get the line to the bait, and this is pre-baiting, so it's like really, uh, once you get the line to the bait, and this is, this was taken, what is it, that's August, isn't it, 2nd of August, so mm. eight days ago. So we had this male come in to feed on one of our baits, and then all systems go, we find the vets, and everybody's like mobilized, and it's all like action stations, and everybody's like totally adrenaline hyped. Um, and off we go and then we, we take our cage out there to the place where we set the cage and basically you end up with this beautiful setting like this, like you note the, 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 the meat's in the back there, the wine is in the corner on the bottom right. And, and we put these trap transmitters in the cages and we put a, and we put a cell phone camera there so that when the trap door goes down we can get the signal from the cage going and uh, getting triggered, as well as a photograph of what's in the cage, sent by a cell phone, okay? Um, and anyway, we set these and uh, that particular line didn't come back, and in fact, um, we, none came back this week. But, but this is what a leopard looks like in a cage, right? Now, mountain lions are very chilled in cages. They like, sometimes they ignore you and just carry on feeding. But leopards are... So, the cages are, you know, ca any trapping method can be bad for the animal. It's how you do it, and importantly, it's the reaction time and how long it takes you to get there. So, we literally stay up the whole night, and this is why I'm a little sort of teetering on my feet at the moment is because we're monitoring the trap the whole time so that as soon as the door goes down we can go in there within minutes we can actually uh, immobilize the animal before it can do any harm to itself. Cages, foot snares, foot snares are great because they're, um, you know, the animals can't bite on anything, the cages are an issue where you know, they could hurt, hurt their teeth but if we get there quickly then you know, we don't, usually don't have any issues. Um, so that's what we're using in this area and once we've got, once we've um, immobilized the animal, it takes about 8 minutes for the animal to, to, to go down and then we've got about 45 minutes to work with it to get measurements and well, you've got to get blood and DNA or tissue samples for DNA and we do oral swabs and nasal swabs and rectal swabs and temperatures and blood pressure and the pulse oximeter is going and we're shouting numbers out this way and this way and it's it's, but quietly, because these cats are on ketamine, okay? Mm -hmm. So ketamine oh, and metatomidine, so they're like, you know, woo, 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 spacey. So you've got to be very careful, you've got to be very quiet, and like, you've got to do this, so you, like, I'm just wound up now because we didn't catch a cat. But, um, <laughs> but we, we, um, we do this very quietly, methodically, right, getting all this stuff done. 45 minutes flat, we've got the collar on, we've weighed the animal, we've done all the stuff, and poop, we just like, let it go again, and off it goes, and then we can track it, okay? And... The collar, you know, we wish the batteries would last forever, but unfortunately they don't. The batteries allow us, the way we set them, to run for 14 months. And for 14 months, every two hours, we're getting a GPS point. And that's going to tell us where the cat's been that whole time, for 14 months. 12 times a day, every two hours. Cats walking around, boom, 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 and we're going to get these points. And 4,000 GPS points later, you've got, a, you've got a pretty good idea of where this cat, how it's using its habitat, okay? We look at the teeth and that to make sure they don't hurt themselves and as well. Lovely teeth. That, I'm sorry, I'm just going to actually mention that the yellowness is that helps you with the aging. That one like, looks like it's been smoking 40 a day. <laughs> That's pretty much like an adult, um, you know, with, uh, and the wear on the teeth. And this is a six-month-old kitten, mountain lion kitten. Uh, yeah. 
So when we're tracking them, this is kind of what you plot these points out over the landscape, you know, and you end up just fantastic. Now in this area, once we've got these cats covered, we are going to be able to project this over Sonoma and Napa and be able to show you how these cats are using this lands landscape and identify these important corridors that we need to look at for not just mountain lions, but the mountain lions see this from a perspective that will help us get an idea of what are important wildlife corridors. Okay? And the other thing is that um, we're going to get an idea of how big their ranges are. And because these solitary cats have got exclusive ranges, we can enumerate them to some degree. Pretty accurately, we can get some kind of idea of how many resident cats there are in our area, right? Now, the home ranges and territories of, or ter or territories of mountain lions in an area like this could be as big as 200 square miles for a male, which is pretty big. That's 20 miles going up, 10 miles going across. Now, the Mayakama mountain range, or well, this area, we've got Arrowhead Mountain down here, and you guys are here somewhere, and it's like you go up here. This is only six miles wide at the widest, you know? So you can go right up to Calistoga Road from Arrowhead Mountain, and, and it might be one male's territory, one male cruising around in that whole area. One dude on his own. That's crazy. It's just, like, so amazing. And within his area, he's going to have, like, two or three females, and each of them are going to have their exclusive territories. It's possible that one male could have this whole area, including Sonoma Mountain and, and Annadale, as well. We just don't know. I mean, this is kind of my hypothesis of what we're going to find. And based on my work previously and other work that's been done in mountain lions, this is possibly what we're going to see. We're going to do questions in a moment, uh, at the end, please, if you don't mind. Thanks. Um, but essentially, we're going to find out how big the ranges are and how many there might be throughout the, throughout the area. The other thing is, when you imagine those points being taken every two hours, Suddenly, if you get like a whole bunch of these points sequentially clustered, like for a day or two in one place, that means the cat's hanging about there for some reason. What is it doing? Is it a resting site? Is it a feeding site? Is it a breeding site? Is it, is it, is it um, a den site for a female? Is it dead? Um, you know, so the collars are going to be able to give us that feedback um, on, on that. And what we do then is retrospectively, two weeks later, once we've analyzed the data as we go along, two weeks, ten, 10 days to two weeks later, we go back and investigate each one of those sites to find the remains of a kill, for instance, if there was a kill. And we can you find hairs and bone fragments and scats and that sort of thing. And we can reconstruct the diet of the animal over the entire period that it's colored, which is so cool. And you, we've got good evidence to show that we can do that for any animals, like raccoon sized up, basically. Find out what they've been eating for that whole time. Um, and, for instance, we know that mountain lions will eat, a male would eat about four deer a month. And females, because they've often got kittens, are eating six to eight deer a month. Now that's, that information is not through metabolic rate analysis, it's through actually finding their kills and actually seeing what they're doing. So that's, that's a deer that's been killed by a mountain lion. The, the educational component of the project, as I mentioned, the outreach and education, ACR does some amazing work with children and adults. We take, we have about 10,000 people going out through the organization, being taken out into nature, um, um, about 4,000 or so, or 4,000 or 5,000 at, at Burberry and, and the rest on our west coast properties and that, where we take small groups, where we have volunteers, trained volunteers, docents who go out and, and take groups and show in groups of six at a time, it's fantastic, um, to take them and show them and talk to them about nature and the environment that they're living in. And, you know, the Mountain Lion Project fits in so well with this whole thing where we can share information of how important these animals are in the system. So, I would, in terms of how you can help you know, as the public, one of the things I would certainly suggest if, if you're interested is to, to become an ACR member, um, to look at, at becoming a docent, um, 
you know, to, to have a look at the information that um, um, Jennifer Newman, my colleague at the back, is so kind to come through tonight to bring, bring us all this information. You must please, after the talk, just come and have a look at this, and, um, and you're welcome to take, take stuff away. And that, um, we've got a, a questionnaire that's on, on the website, on our website, so get our website details. And the, and the questionnaire is there to, for us to establish baseline data on what the public's sort of perceptions are about mountain lions. And, and, and essentially be able to, you know, in three years' time or whatever it is, see whether our project has had any kind of impact on those perceptions um, through our outreach in, in this community. Um, if you have any sightings of mountain lions, I don't know if you can see the cat over there in the corner yeah. on the left, and there's another yeah. tail over here, it's a female with a kitten. Um, you know, that would be great to get information on sightings or kill sites if you find a deer that's been killed or something like that, that would be amazing. Also, you must remember that when we're analyzing, retrospectively analyzing those, those kill locations or those clusters, should I say, we are going to need access to the, the land that those clusters are. Now, those clusters are going to be randomly spread out throughout the county, and, and we're going to be able to sort of look up on a map and see, okay, this property belongs to so-and-so. We're going to you know, need access to go in there to go to investigate those clusters. So access to land is really uh, very important for the success of the project to get the, the, um, the data that we need. You can look out for signs of mountain lions, like sniffing mountain lion scrapes. Mountain lions often mark their territories by scraping the ground. Um, and the scrapes are about you know, that long and about that wide, I suppose. And, and, and they urinate or defecate there, that place. And those scrapes are there to mark off the territories and advertise to other animals to stay out or to attract animals if it's a female, an estrus or something like that. And if you're wine tasting, this is a really good way of clearing the palate. <laughs> it sort of really gives you, you know, between, between vineyards or between courses. Of life. It's really good. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. And if you have any questions, I suggest um, you fire away and um, I'll hopefully be able to answer you. Yes, so you've had your hand up for a little while. You mentioned that the male lion has a big territory with maybe three females, so they're going to reproduce. What happens with the male offspring? Are they allowed to stay in that area or are they, you know? No, no they're not. They kicked out like all children should be at the right age. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear that. <laughs> so, in fact, you did hear that. <laughs> Take note. <laughs> So when you're 18, um, so with mountain lions, what happens is, is that the, the kittens stay with the mom till they're about a year or a year and a half old, sometimes even up to two years, um, and then she boots them out. And pretty much they have to, you know, with females, sometimes the female will hand some of her territory over to um, her female offspring, not always. But the males are always pretty much booted out, and they become what we, we to, uh, call dispersal animals. And between that age and when they're old enough to take over a territory, they are staying under the radar. They disappear and they disperse. And, you know, there was a recent account of a mountain lion that dispersed from South Dakota to Connecticut. 1,600 miles. So they can really leg it. I mean, these guys, they, you know, they... They are, um, with P22 for instance, the mountain lion in Griffith Park, the Santa Monica system is at the moment totally shut off because of the highways. So for 10 years of monitoring the cats in that area, no cats could get in and no cats could get out alive. They all died except for one cat that managed to get in and managed to bring new genes to the population, adding 22 new alleles to the the population in the Santa Monica's that had been cut off. The cat that got out was P22 when he was a youngster. He was like, I'm going to get beat up by the, the, the adult in the area. And so he just didn't, don't, the 405, 101, it doesn't matter, I'm not out of here, you know? And he managed to get into Griffith Park. 
got in there and there was like no one else there because nobody else could get there. It was like this tiny little kit uh, cat litter box for a mountain lion. And it's like, it was great, there was deer and everything and no competition and he was just hanging out and hanging out and then eventually he's like, wait a minute, you know, there are no girls here, you know, what's wrong with this picture? And then he started, you know, because he's been collared the whole time, you can actually see him trying to get out. But he's not as determined to get out as when he was trying to get out of, like, as a dispersal animal. So these guys are cruising under the radar and you would think that the population would go up because they have all these offspring, but those territories are like puzzle pieces and they pretty much remain the same based on prey, avail prey availability and, and whoever, whoever can't make it dies along the way. The, you know, the mortality rates of lions are high, you know, they're dying of all sorts of things, malnutrition, being beaten up and all sorts of things. But they pretty much have a hard life, you know, um, trying to survive. That, sorry. Excuse me, how many lions are you tracking in this area now? Let me think. Mm. None at the moment. <laughs> so we, we just got our permits recently, like a few, like just about a month ago. And summer is not the best time for trapping because the baits, the heat is so ruthless and brutal on the baits and that sort of thing. But we started trapping and we had lions on baits and they didn't return. So we don't have any with collars on at the moment. But we're hoping to be able to collar and monitor the whole well, it's a, the whole population, pretty much as many of the animals in the area as possible. And also being able to get dispersal animals where possible, because with the satellite collars, we can actually see where they go. Cool. Yeah. When you mentioned chaparral, you used another term that said something like corridor. Did you say fire corridor? Fainbos. It's a, it's a vegetation, it's, an, it's in fact a biome um, in, in um, uh, um, in South Africa. So it's a fire driven ecosystem. It's one of, um, uh, yeah, it's very similar to the chaparral. And then what happens to the collar after the battery dies? So at 14 months, the collar drops off. Hmm. And we've got a drop off device on it, and we've got a backup drop off device that if the, if the drop off device doesn't work, the other, the other cotton spacer then decomposes and within two years the collar will fall off. Mm -hmm. At 12 months, we would probably start trying to find a cluster, a kill that the lion makes and then actually try and recapture the animal. If we want to recolor it, it's a perfect opportunity to go and use one of the kills it made, set a trap, take that collar off and put a new one on and, and monitor, keep monitoring the population because what we would want to do is over the three or four years that we would need to get good data for this area, um, we would want to have a contiguous population monitored all at the same time to see how they interact and, and that all at once. Uh, yes? So you mentioned the foot snares. The foot snares, though, that's not the metal traps. Metal foot, foot snares are, it's a cable snare, it's called a cable restraint or a foot loop trap or a foot snare. It's a, um, it's a very specialized technique for researchers to use. We use it in a very specific way. It's a thick cable that we use and we monitor the traps intensively. We put special stoppers on so that, it doesn't, so that the, the snare doesn't constrict the blood flow of the animal, for instance. Um, and it's on a bungee things so it's got elasticity so it doesn't damage ligaments or anything like that but what's great about the foot snares and hopefully they'll bring them back into California again because you used to be able to use them in California until about three years ago um, is that when the cat's caught in one of these snares and again it should only be used by trained very highly trained people and, and for research purposes is that the animal doesn't have anything to bite on it doesn't it's not enclosed in anything that it wants so it spins around and then it's like Ah, okay, well it just hangs about there, you know, and, and then, you know, you can go in and dart it. The cages are, once an animal's caught in something, it's trying to get out, and that's where the damage to the claws and teeth, there's always, it's a higher risk from that point of view. But either way, both methods are tools that need to be used in a very, very specific way and um, to minimize and that's why we intensively monitor these traps like this, is to minimize the stress and the, any potential injury. So, yeah. Do you have any uh, estimate of the 
average longevity of these animals in this area? Well, um, from what we know, I'm really surprised at the fact that these animals don't live very long in this area. The Santa Cruz project, which has been going for over 10 years now, recently caught a male, which was their oldest cat, and they estimated the age at just over eight. Oh, and that is like, wow. I'm like, whoa, that is crazy, because we would get leopards getting to like 15 or 16, and we even had one male that got 17. Normally the females get older than the males. Um, but I think it just shows you that the you know, mortality due to human-induced um, uh, conflict or, or human-related um, incidents is quite high there. You know, the, the mortality, uh, the, the poisoning, secondary poisoning through rodenticides is, is, a is, is something we need to look into, you know, poisoning issues, um, vehicle collisions, and then depredation permits. You know, we've seen... In, uh, from 1988, a massive increase in depredation permits throughout the counties, and and the thing is, is as and this is where this sort of outreach is important, is is that if you look at these territories, what happens when you remove one of these resident animals in the case of a depredation incident? That animal is actually your best guard because he's constantly marking and doing everything it can to keep other mountain, mountain lions out. Now once they've established their territories, they kind of have big territories because the males are trying to get as many females as possible, so they go, wow, big territories, but they can't go too big because then they can't control it. Um, and you take that guy out, you create a vacuum, and essentially you're opening it up for these dispersal animals that are cruising around looking for, for gaps in the system. And, you can actually end up with an artificially elevated population as a result. You can end up with animals that are genetically not fit enough to, to, to be in that area because they haven't had to fight for it. You've, you're ending up in an area where if you are, and you have to pretty much protect your livestock, or you know, to, you know, in cases where you have livestock or pets, um, if you do things that the resident animal becomes familiar with, that he knows he doesn't have access to those animals, he'll just leave them alone. But these other guys, they don't know. They just come in there and they end up causing more trouble than anything else. So, um, you know, those are some issues which, which could actually affect the population quite, quite badly. Yes? Are there methods that you guys are working on to help, like, farmers and people who own livestock keep mountain lions away without harming them? Um, yes, and yes, and <laughs> let me explain. Uh, I, um, from my experience, I think, first of all, the research is important. We need to have a really good understanding of what's happening in the system. I think that helps us a lot. We have some basic things that we know, and, and the outreach, the information that we can share through the outreach is, is important in sharing um, things like, if you remove a resident animal, you're going to end up with more issues. and, and you know, the only way you can really deal with this is by protecting those are protecting your livestock. They're, they're basic things. Each farmer or you know livestock farmer has a different situation that one needs to look into. And, and we are there are um, deterrents, electronic deterrents, and things like that that people can look at using. But essentially, um, you know, um, it's not a focus of what we're doing now is do that specific part of it. It's something where we try to provide the information and at a later stage where we can add empirical data through testing some of these electronic devices, for instance, then we can do that. I wouldn't want to promote a device, for instance, without actually having done scientific research on it to show whether it works or not. So. I have a question. Um, going back to the rodenticide, um, are y'all doing anything at a legislative level to ban the rodenticide? I know Assembly Member Bloom put forth the bill um, that's going through the Assembly and probably is going to go to the Senate uh, to ban all rodenticides throughout the state of California. I know November, I believe it was November 11th of last year, P34, which is another famous um, mountain lion, if I'm not mistaken, she winded up dying because she wanted up eating a, a, I don't know if it was a rat or 
something that had rodenticide in it. Yeah. So are y'all doing anything at a legislative level to to help with the rodenticide? Because I know that is a big, you know, that that's one of the talking with Glenn, you know, that's one of the number one pillars of, of our big predators. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a number one killer. We've actually, I mean, um, certainly bobcats have suffered the most, and that's where the legislation has, was um, the initial re the uh, promotion of it was uh, through the bobcat research in the in, in Southern California. Um, but it, it certainly is a risk, and what we're doing through our project is contributing data and working very closely with um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, so providing samples for. Um, the, their, them and UC Davis, who we're working with. So we essentially, through the capture and monitoring of these populations, are able to provide data, which are then used to, to be able to uh, back the uh, legislation. One more thing, just so everybody knows that we did ban bobcat trapping throughout the whole state of California. So yeah. no trapper can, unless a biologist, yeah. someone like him, can trap bobcats. Just yeah. wanted to share that. Great. That's excellent. Thank you. Oh, the question at the back. Do you ever do dog trim? So we have permits to use hounds um, uh, for you know we have our capture permits allow us to use hounds for trapping uh, or ca capturing mountain lions, um, and they're used very effectively in in a lot of wilderness areas. And that um, we have a concern with them here because the area is so fragmented. The properties are so small that you end up running over 20, um, you know, 20 properties before you can get the cat and that's not going to work here. Um, so it's just it's an issue. I've never done hound captures before. I've worked very closely with people who have um, and it's, it's very effective. I kind of imagine it's quite stressful for the animal mm -hmm. um, being chased by dogs but um, you know, it's, I don't know. So it's, um, uh, we're not going to be using it unless in a very special circumstance in an area where we think it can work. Um, we stick into the cages. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, you went first, yeah. How do you weigh the cats? How do we weigh them? <laughs> oh, yeah, so we have a canvas. Scale, or? Yeah, we have a canvas um, that we, we sort of get the cat onto a canvas and then we um, just have a pole with a, a scale that we attach and pick it up like that, yeah. Okay. yeah. I was just going to ask you how you came to do this project in California. What brought you here? That postcard. Was <laughs> <laughs> that a successful project? <laughs> I don't know. I'm still trying. But uh, um, it's it's you know I attended. Um, I got. Uh, I mentioned that I was interested in the analogous species, um, uh, looking at mountain lions versus our mountain leopards um, and in different areas, and and I ended up um, going to. Every three years in the States, you have a, there's a big workshop, a mountain lion workshop. And I went to the 2014 mountain lion workshop in, um, in Utah. And I was blown away by the fact that there were 150 delegates there. And 149 or 148 of them were researchers or officials doing research and work with mountain lions. And there was no outreach. Um, being you know, shown there. Mountain Lion Foundation was one organization there and one, there was another organization. But, you know, I think that, that the, the research has been done that we can share, that get it out there. And it's getting people connected and you need, you know, sometimes it's just like, need somebody like ACR to invite people to connect them to nature and show and share fact that we've got um, these awesome animals here and you shouldn't be afraid. I mean, I'll give you a good example. I did a talk. There was these flyers that were going around in a suburb in Nelig uh, um, Lolita Road in Sonoma around there. People were like frightened. There was a mountain lion lurking in the, in the mists and people were freaking out and they were calling fish and wildlife and all of this. And I was invited to go and do a talk in the neighborhood and I did it in somebody's back garden. And we had like 60 people come wandering you know, from their homes around into the back garden and just chatting to them about the fact that, you know what, you're living on the edge of a natural habitat. You know, you, this is the edge of a territory. The edges are really important for these, these cats because they're, they're 
the edges of their territories. You know, that's like the, the, your fences, your border, you're patrolling them. So, talking to them about it. And, you know, the next day, the person that invited me to come to, to do the talk was walking her dog around there. She didn't get very far because every, people were in the streets going, you know, it's so cool, we got mountain lions here, you know. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, cool. It's like, so, you know, forget the landscape of fear thing, you know. I mean, you got... Uh, like, you know, and just know more about them and be jazzed about them and, and um, I think it's great, you know, so uh, that's kind of, mm. that's what I'm hoping to contribute. You know, there was a, uh, oh, sorry. a Saudi Arabian uh, leopard, uh, according to the newspaper article recently, one was spotted and the first one that's been seen in 10 years. Yeah. It was in the paper a few okay. days ago. Okay, right. Well. You see, the habitat is there if you're in Saudi Arabia, but the, the thing is, is that the, it's very difficult to be a resident cat if you don't have um, the, the prey has been depleted through hunting yeah. completely and um, it's trash. So the <coughs> Yemen and Oman are the source population. So you can always, you, you have a cat moving 1,600 miles yeah. as well as mountain lion. Yeah. You just have a cat moving through there looking for a place. And they do come up. They've been. There were a number of leopards that had been killed, um, you know, over the last 15, 20 years in Saudi Arabia. But no sign of resident cats. Yeah. That's the difference. <coughs> Sorry. Any, any suggestions on what you should do if you happen to be out walking through the hills and there's a nice, beautiful mountain lion? Well, I you can take a selfie. So, I mean, for, so let's, let's think about this. It's something that I think about a lot because, you know, it's going to end up biting me on the, you know, with this whole thing. Um, I've had people telling me, like, you know, they've had mountain lions stalking them from, like, you know, so, so how far, you know, like 50 yards away. They saw the mountain lion and it was stalking them and it was going to attack, you know. And the thing is, is that, like, if you're going to be attacked by a mountain lion, you're not going to know about it, okay? Because that's what they rely on, this stuff, okay? If you come across a mountain lion, you're engaging with it, okay? There's an opportunity to engage with it. Now, there are various ways that you, you can engage with it. And like cats, they're very curious. So still, that's one thing that might happen is it's curious. The other thing, it might just run away. It depends on how you come across it, you know? So, um, all animals and people have got a space, you know? You've got a fight and flight sort of circle around you, you know, and if you end up too close to an animal, you know, it might, it might be in that fight circle. If it's, if it's not, then it's going to react in a different way. It will either run away or, or it's just curious. You can, the important thing with mountain lions is, or any cat, is never run. Never turn your back on a cat. That's number one. Uh, make yourself as big as possible, shout and get a stick. You know, I, I, the rock thing is, I've seen cats react a little bit to rocks and that, but, but shout, use expletives. <laughs> whatever you can think of. Different languages. It's like, yeah, Spanish, but you can try Zulu, all sorts of things. Um, and, and make yourself appear, um, whatever. But initially, I mean, I would say, just watch it, enjoy it, you know, because the chances of seeing them are so slim. I mean, I'm amazed at how many people do actually see mountain lions here. Um, and it's, you know, compared to like our mountain leopards, we very few people saw them. Um, so it's an amazing opportunity. If it gets a bit hairy, then get to that, you know, and, the, and if it gets, you know, back off. But what cats do is, is that they'll mock charge. You know, if you, uh, the cat, you've know, you got to watch their body language. The, you know, the ears are going flat. Watch your house cat, you know, just look at, look at, you know, you just got to look, they're just the same sort of thing. Twitching, the tails sort of, and the ears are going flat or whatever. They will mock charge. It's very unlikely that a cat is going to... We relied in the safari industry, we carried rifles with us, and we were pretty much told, you'll, you'll never work in the safari industry ever again if you had to shoot a cat. So we were, we were taught to get down to the cat level because they move so quickly and you basically just wait and the cat will stop there when it mock charges. From a full mock charge, dust and growling and spitting and claws going and tail bashing, you just stand your ground and you go, that's all you can do. Because anyway, if you, <laughs> you, you can't do anything else, it's, it's going to kill you. It doesn't stop, so you may as well just, just stand there. 
much. Are there any known corridors through the Napa Valley? I mean, coming out of the Mayacamas and across to the east side of the valley and up in the hills that way? Are there um, corridors that they go through? Well, I mean, so the 29, I mean, like the way I see it, you know, just looking at the 29 um, as being, you know, I think that that looks to me like it's going to be the edge of a territory for cats that are going north to south along the Mayacamas. And then, you know, the other cats are utilizing the Lake Berryessa sort of area and then going north and, and using those nice natural areas. There's nothing stopping cats from moving across between the two, whether they'd want to or not, it's like why kind of thing. You know? So they investigate whatever, just animals can move through, no problem. Um, but I don't think with such a wide barrier with the vineyards going on either side of 29, I think that's kind of an area which won't be utilized much, but you'll be still be able to get movement. You'll be surprised where they can move. And normally the cats that are going in really into the urban or suburban areas um, and, and that may often be dispersed for animals that are just like looking for any way to avoid the adults. They're using sub-optimum habitat. Mm. Yeah. And they like drainages, ridge lines and things like that. Yeah. But look out for signs, scrapes and things like that. You know, they, it's, uh, it's, uh, and then you sniff at you and take it. <laughs> <laughs> Great.